Good morning, everybody. Um, I hope you have rested well. Uh, for those of you who are back for the second day of field meeting today here uh, during Asian Contemporary Art Week, the signature event. Um, I'm Lisa Ahmadi, and next to me is? Uh, this is Shin, if you don't already know. Shin Wang. Um, I direct the Asian Contemporary Art Week, and Shin has joined as a, a associate curator. Um, the two of us have been um, very busy organizing this event. Uh, it's a curatorial endeavor. I wanted to just quickly introduce it, um, the concept, uh, to you because uh, some of you might have not been here yesterday. Uh, but I will not go uh, into too much detail and read um, my statement uh, the way I did yesterday. I just wanted to share uh, the concept of the communal studio visit um, in reference to um, thinking uh, from a very personal but also uh, to me, it's also an intellectual uh, insight um, that, uh, uh, that came to me during a studio visit um, with an artist in New Delhi. Um, her name is Shiba Chachi. Uh, we had a, a really beautiful exchange. And in that studio visit, um, during our exchange of speaking and interpreting and reading her work together, um, I realized that um, I was being in the presence of a very beautiful, creative individual, and um, that I was in the presence of brilliance. Um, but in that same moment, I also recognized that it was um, myself being there in that moment that was um, participating and creating that brilliancy or that moment of um, intuition between the two of us and knowledge. And um, it really... Um, in a concrete way made it very clear for the first time to me what curatorial work is. That it's not just um, this endeavor to constantly uh, look for an end result uh, whereby I'm running and trying to figure out which space and how do I exhibit an artist's work, but that it's the process and the uh, actual conceptual uh, uh, contribution that I'm making in my interactions with artists in the way that uh, I encourage them and the way that I receive them and the way that I read their work with them in the inquiries that I make with their work. And um, that that's the most uh, important aspect of curatorial work and that in itself is an exhibition in its own um, right. And so out of that, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the reality of how artists actually end up in institutions and museums and galleries and um, realize that um, it's not through the biennials necessary, it's not through the art fairs, it's not through the exhibitions. Um, obviously, those are our first entry points and encounters, but um, generally, the way that we nurture uh, our relationships with artists and institutions and um, uh, forge partnerships is when we actually make that connection, um, uh, energetic connection, with the artist and understand their work from a different place when we were, when we were engaged with them. And so out of that came the idea of um, field meeting where by um, using the opportunity to expose uh, the professionals, you in the field, in the field to um, uh, be exposed to some of the most uh, active uh, voices and creatives, um, thinkers, doers, um, in, the, in the Asian uh, panorama. So um, in, the, in, in the spirit of that, uh, we came up with a number of different um, uh, reasonings why this is very important and why it's still relevant to have the so-called platform Asian Contemporary Art Week. Um, I will read you uh, some of the um, uh, declarations or intentions behind field meeting, but before I do that, I think I want to let Shin also speak, um, you know, some of her own um, personal uh, and uh, insights into why she wanted to be part of a field meeting. All right. Good morning. Um, I actually want to start by uh, thanking Lisa for involving me in this. 
because um, as a young curator or aspiring curator working in New York and being a woman, there's a lot of realities that you cannot unsubscribe from. So I really appreciate this opportunity to not only have a voice, but give a voice to the kind of art practices that I, um, I respond to and I think deserve a, a, a bigger and more prominent stage than they currently have and give validation to where they came from. Um, and I also wanted to quickly um, share with you that um, during this whole process, and the artists know that, that Lisa and I do make a point to try to converse with each of the artists. And in preparation for this communal studio visit, we did many, many studio visits in preparation for that. Um, and thank you, uh, all of the artists, for working with us, because there are several cases where we um, pushed back and forth making sure the artist um, got our point um, instead of presenting something that they would usually throw out in a symposium situation um, or a talking head situation that you see in so many places, especially in China where there's not really a public speech component um, to the kind of com uh, communications uh, about ideas and art. Um, and, and really getting that result. Um, and I think those of you who were here yesterday uh, was witnessed all of the um, effort and the results of that. So thank you. That that's true. Actually, that was a, a very important point. Thank you, Shen. Um, that we did ask um, everyone to, without um, leaving themselves out of it or doing something um, completely um, uh, that would make them completely feel like they're it, it's not them, um, while being themselves to take the risk of doing something. Uh, that they might not normally do uh, with us because um, that's the other um, aspect that, you know, even though you have that 15 minutes short time, um, this is uh, the opportunity to um, really speak who you are and why you do what you do. And I think that um, I acknowledge, again, the artists, they did incredible work. Um, I think we're going to just, uh, I'm going to do what I said. I'm going to read the intentions again because it's, a, it's a, another energetic declaration that I hope that the universe then manifests uh, for us. Um, what field meeting envisions a very broad and open representation of Asia, dissemination of artistic practice as an ongoing process as opposed to end results, shedding light on unconventional exhibition making practices, highlighting active artists and initiatives in a much more timely and less mediated fashion, facilitating exchange beyond established institu institutional representation and discourse, addressing large gaps in the ratio of Asia-based artists represented in US museums, galleries, and institutions, forging partnerships future collaborations, nurturing lasting relationships between artists, art professionals, and organizations in the United States and various regions of Asia, creating access to unfamiliar yet existing art historical scholarship, inspiring new and rigorous research, analysis of new institutional models specific to local arenas, and acknowledgement of various specificities in artworks, artists, and approaches. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day. And sorry we're late, but we will make up with the time. And just a quick announcement for speakers. If you don't know how to use the clicker, I'm sitting right there. So ask me before you go. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we thought it would be very conventional to sit, uh, to stand over there, so we prefer to sit on the carpet that will remain our magic uh, platform for um, exploring the topic that we're going to talk about. Um, islands, archipelagos, and other liquid territories uh, first, and then Atlas of Asia Art Archive on the second part. So let's start and um, with the first part. And basically, um, we arrived in Hong Kong, Valerie and I, in 1995, not by boat, but what we did for the first years was basically to study the territory 
in various, uh, various way, and um, the result of that was a, a publication first, a Mapping HK that was um, in 2000 presented in a Venice Biennale architecture um, exhibition. And basically, the logic of the research was to unfold various dynamics of, uh, of Hong Kong through movements. So, for example, notion of temporal density, notion of appropriation of space, and so on. So that was the first discovery of this, um, of this island. It took us another probably two years, two, three years, to really discover that Hong Kong was an island. And this is the first kind of drawing sketch um, representing um, this island and basically what, how this island is composed and what are the main uh, characteristics of it. So what I'm going to do here in this first part is basically unfold the various projects on islands that we have done along the way, starting in 1999 and ending uh, so far today or in a in, uh, in, um, in couple of days. And the first project is basically bringing artificial islands uh, in Hong Kong and as a kind of reaction to um, this kind of global movement, tourism, uh, this kind of... Uh, um, uh, um, big uh, um, movement of uh, Hong Kong people going abroad and enjoying island paradise and so on. So basically we decide maybe one way is to bring the paradise into Hong Kong and, and, uh, and see what could happen on that. So basically territories, floating territories, as a first, uh, first kind of intention, uh, a first project in, uh, in the situation of Hong Kong. The second, second project and probably here I'm spanning basically our entire career almost, is basically the one that we have been commissioned by the MoMA and that will happen next month, um, will open next month as a group show called Uneven Growth, the Future of Mega Cities. And Hong Kong amongst five other cities has been basically chosen to see what will happen in 15 years. Uh, 15 years time in facing this kind of massive urbanization. So what I will do here is basically unfold this project and through the, through the, the development of this project looking at other uh, uh, projects uh, that we have been doing along the way. Oh, so to start with is basically identify um, issues and contexts and communities that we have been working on and that could be symptomatic about what Hong Kong is and what Hong Kong could be. So here is eight different contexts addressing those issues. Very early on, we thought that the context is something that we will somehow repeat ourselves and do another mapping Hong Kong, and we didn't want to do that. So basically, what happened along the way is the fictionalization of those contexts. And here, we have the first sketch of um, what uh, we call the decontextualization and uh, re-territorialization, re basically transforming those uh, eight contexts into eight different islands. A long debate about, among us about is that utopian island, heterotopian island, ut um, dystopian island, they are probably all of those at the same time. So, sorry. So the result or a fragment of the result will be those eight islands moving from the island of land to the island of sea and the last one, the island of memory. So memories. So what I will do now is basically looking at those eight, uh, uh, eight different islands. So the first one, like everything in Hong Kong starts with the land. The land is as is a material, is basically the main value. How do we possess the land, how do we construct the land? Historically has been the case, and it's still the case today. I mean, probably transform into property, uh, property issue. So that has been somehow the, the kind of consistent uh, materiality along my office trajectories. And just to unfold, this is various projects on the side, just to unfold one is 2007, uh, Venice Biennale, a representation Hong Kong Pavilion, where we build an island made of, out of oyster shell and inhabited by 16 talking parrots, artificial parrots. So basically that was uh, the, the installation 
in 2007, that was basically the moment where we were celebrating the 10 years anniversary of the retrocession. Explaining through the parrots this idea that uh, Rabindranath Tagore uh, uh, explored with the parrots' tale as a kind of harsh criticism of, of colonization. The second aspect is basically the possibility of transforming the tr our vision or perspective on the territory with this idea that everything could be liquid. And the very we'll talk about that. And this is a perfect representation. Here we are sitting on the solid sea while you are on the liquid land around us. So this is talking essentially about communities, it's talking about food and the possibility of reinventing food in Hong Kong using seaweeds rather than agricultural product and, and, and so on. And the community that has been doing that in the past and now forgotten could be reinvented in the future. That's also a way that um, looking at Asia and, and uh, and this possibility of embracing Asia more from a liquid perspective than a landmass approach. So you have various projects, um, uh, uh, for example, the development of the liquid border uh, in the middle, the photo in the middle, the communities, and the, on the top, um, the, fo the, the, the image of the installation in the Canary Island, which was uh, uh, named uh, so liquid land, uh, uh, solid sea, where we inverted the logic of uh, uh, constructing uh, constructing, constructing land on water and liquidifying uh, 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 the land um, with a uh, wax system. So also as a curatorial approach, this uh, project that was um, Develop uh, not not long ago called uh, Liquid Asia, where basically we were curating a show, embracing this idea of of Asia as a liquid uh, uh, continent. So that leads us to this conclusion um, that island is land, and when we say that, is basically not just land, but is the value that the land will embrace. And that's very important, essentially, if we look at the political, geopolitical development around our region recently. So also, uh, looking at this project, uh, which I will probably talk about later, but uh, the um, invisible island, and here is basically one of the island look from the mirror, rear view mirror. The idea of the self, the idea of possible freedom, very important at the moment uh, in the situation of Hong Kong, where basically one of the possibilities to invent a new social contract is to invent a new perspective in looking at the various, uh, uh, various uh, platforms we're operating from. And just looking at the lower one is basically when we were doing in 2007 the Venice Biennale for the Hong Kong Pavilion, we were also interested to take part of the China Pavilion. And offering one square meter of land to China in Venice and bringing those personal island that was written on the top of the marble and dropping it on the day of the opening at, uh, at the Venice Biennale Pavilion next to Chao Fei. Fragment domestic is basically this idea that um, we could reinvent new form of economies, geography can be constructing differently. And here we have, for example, the project called Desert Island, which is 100 um, islands, existing islands, all man-made manipulated from tax uh, paradise to nuclear testing to prisons and so on, and basically exploring them and exploding all of them by form of representation, locating them in a, in a, in a mirror, organize them, in a form of uh, a graveyard and basically exhibiting uh, their uh, future. Transforming them uh, not so long after, one year after, into domesticated um, islands in, uh, in, um, with a show called Simply Enjoy the Scenery. So that's a project, the Invisible Island, still ongoing, is basically reinventing the territory of Hong Kong from a water perspective and the exploration of 33 islands that's basically allow us to reconsider entirely the history and the geography of the territory. Um, along that, this is uh, one of those exploration um, looking at one little, not even an island, not even an islet, called a rock, 
which was like something 10 meters, uh, 10 meters long rock, which we modelized and basically wanted to build an island that will serve as uh, a location for voluntary castaway. And uh, in that case, I think we wanted to have our son um, naked on it. And uh, the reason why, because he's basically exploring the idea of the castaway today, but also um, to figure out for how long, uh, for, uh, uh, figure out uh, for two days where he will be. Um, a recent project, um, at the David is this um, island for colorblind. It's a three meters platform. Uh, where we um, place um, 3,500 sea, ocean, um, reed, natural, green, and red, forming a 69. The irony of it is basically I'm colorblind, and that's probably the project that really justifies the need of two people. <laughs> in, the, in the group, obviously. Uh, fear and politic, again, uh, very much linked to uh, what's going on at the moment in, in Hong Kong and Hong Kong relation to China. Um, it's basically an existing island uh, that serves for, um, for emergency kind of uh, uh, evacuation uh, uh, next to uh, Hong Kong airport. And we transform that as, as a, a a place where basically we could eventually escape and build another form of community. Um, the notion of fear and this kind of psychology behind the island is very interesting, has been very, uh, very explored in various projects, and I, I will not unfold all of them, but viral operation in 2003 was uh, basically taking on the, 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 the virus the SARS and spreading the SARS from Berlin, from Hong Kong to Berlin and Berlin to Venice and uh, through a video and, and basically crossing as many borders as we could. Another one is Island Profile, which is basically an island uh, looking at the contemporary castaway uh, of today, such as uh, uh, artist, Chinese artist Ai Weiwei or um, Julian, uh, Julian Assange or uh, Sno um, Edward Snowden and so on. And the last, uh, just to refer to the, the, those, those projects, Disputed, which is basically a dartboard game and is taking on this disputed uh, conflict that exists not only in uh, South China Sea but somehow uh, everywhere in the world and that could be easily solved uh, by uh, playing darts. So the number of countries that basically claim the islands could have their own flag and dispute uh, that uh, along a game. I mean, we are invented the ping pong diplomacy, why not the dark game uh, uh, board? Uh, so at one point, uh, after one year, we realized that uh, the, um, the island was fertilized, the island that we see in, in, uh, in, in uh, Venice with the parrots fertilized, and, and basically something grew out of it. So that's, that's the result of it, Hong Kong colony here. Another one, uh, the island of surplus, is basically addressing, uh, addressing this kind of accretion, logic of accretion and logic of value, also the logic of positioning yourself towards uh, uh, um, this uh, uh, construction of landscape. So that's, that's basically a different project. I probably not have the time to unfold those just as reference. So the last, the last before the last is the ecology and the Anthropocene. This is the island of endemic species where basically we are very concerned by uh, the Anthropocene and that has been very uh, dominant in, in our recent work. And uh, some of the projects that really work with that, such as uh, the uh, Platform Paradise, the third landscape in Hindhoat, or uh, Light in Pinheiro for the Curitiba Biennale. The last uh, one, oh, sorry, this is uh, uh, to, to kind of wrap up uh, from the beginning, is basically the, um, the entropy of uh, uh, Mapping HK, the book that I was showing you at the beginning, being displayed forming an island uh, surrounded by trashes or cardboards and basically inviting the public to take and walk on the trashes to pick up one book. The last project very will talk, oh, Oh, that's my vacation photo. No, uh, this is um, the <laughs> ding dong. Yeah, I don't want to waste my uh, five minutes bonus time. Uh, 
But what do, should I click to the first one? So basically, the last island about memory and entropy leads us directly to part two, the Atlas of the Art Archive uh, that we developed two years ago. We had the chance for six months to be a resident at the archive, uh, which was fantastic. Also, we saw the archive being born in 2000. I think Mapping HK was one part of the first meter of books that the archive got, and of course, in the 13, 14 years uh, process accumulated a lot of material. Uh, as you may know, the archive are not collecting um, artworks, but they are collecting publications mainly, and it's a fantastic laboratory for researchers to, uh, to explore uh, what has been going on in Asia in the last uh, uh, 15 years or even more, because the collection goes much uh, further. What we did uh, for the first six months, we basically uh, look for territories that we could find in the, atlas, in the archive uh, from the artistic perspective and uh, with the idea from the beginning to develop an atlas and, um, and to uh, unfold uh, all these kind of territorial issues that we could find in the artist monograph uh, mainly. So this is the first one. We quickly realized that water and this kind of idea that Legia is a very liquid uh, territory continent compared to the masslands of Europe or America or Africa uh, would lead us to some very kind of liquid uh, explorations uh, from the artist's perspective. Of course, water or the ocean is the place from where the pirates came, uh, leading to series of work uh, quite fascinating, also where the new route trades uh, were created, uh, creating in this kind uh, what Saigo Chang called the Pan-Pacific Link, um, also part of the identity, very much embedded within the artistic practice of some artists, and uh, we found many boats uh, within the archive uh, territory. We found also uh, that out of uh, 111 uh, artists that we selected and their territories, uh, about 70% were living in exile or very much were living on the move uh, uh, around the world, which I guess is not so much the case for the other continents. Also, the idea of war, of potential conflict were very much embedded within these territories that we discovered, and, and of course the fictionization of the making of a place like Singapore uh, in this case, or uh, this kind of floating home um, in Taiwan, and this kind of very unstable uh, um, liquid uh, relationship to the land uh, by other artists. The ideas also of conflicts, uh, like in this case in Orissa in India, uh, or pollution were also very much embedded and uh, water related um, within the territories that we discovered. And of course in the map of Tiffany Chung. I'm not gonna go through all the, all the artworks. Also I'm not gonna go through the, these kind, kind of maps of how can we understand the place of the artist and the place of fiction within the archive. Uh, but very quickly to present you uh, what has been the result of this residency, this atlas that we wanted to, to, to figure, like, um, to categorize a bit like uh, uh, Borges' uh, um, encyclopedia of uh, the unknown animal, Ch Chinese encyclopedia of, uh, of the unknown animal into 12 categories that we presented, oops, the colors are completely gone, as... Um, as a kind of um, um, little uh, booklet, uh, the one you can find in American motels giving you uh, destination uh, ideas. So we can see also, I mean, the colors are gone, I don't know why, uh, it's color coded and all those colors are related in the form of Portolan connecting um, continents and islands to, to others. So this portolan was later taken on as a kind of abstraction, mapping the different uh, uh, territories. This is the atlas, for example, of over heterotopia, where you can find on one side uh, Zangogu's uh, Taigo Chiang um, boat, and, uh, and that's the end. Just one second to wrap up. Uh, 
Also, as a kind of new format of discussion, we uh, presented after the Atlas in a more dynamic way, inviting 12 participants is a form of uh, performing seminar to present their territories and discuss all those issues around the territories that uh, they were presented. Thank you. And last, extension of the Atlas, the new publication, Mapping Asia. Uh, we have a few copies with us, so welcome to meet us after the conference to pick up a copy. Thank you. Um, okay, so here's the clicker. Oh, can you play the video? Thank you. Um, so my earlier work is performance-based, um, involving my body in specific, sometimes uncomfortable situations. Being physically invested in the work has always been a part of the working process. Um, so uh, the, the work has evolved in um, recent years, about 10 years, into longer site-specific performative narrative videos that deal with cultural imaginaries. Um, Shangri-La is a video installation documenting various attempts to recreate its fictional eponymous subject. In the real-life Shangri-La, a town in China's Yunnan province, renamed in 2002 to attract tourism. By hiring local non-actors and using the existing economies to reproduce symbols such as the sacred snow mountain or uh, idealized images of romantic love, the project reflects on the links between tourism, site-specific, artistic, documentary, and ethnographic practices. Can you play this video? Thanks. Shot in a handheld and documentary fashion, the situations are often rendered surrealist, like uh, here with the monks inside the oxygen pod. There's sound on these videos. Um, could you just check that for me, please? Thanks. And this is also a video. Um, or here, like the mirrored snow mountain traveling by truck across the landscape.
Uh, Route 3 is a three-channel video installation of, about the first highway built through the northern jungles of Laos that unite China with Southeast Asia. And uh, it focuses on a boom and bust casino town built by Chinese entrepreneurs in the secluded jungles of Laos. It's shot in beauty salons on the, along the road and features a roller skater and fantastical narratives about the shifting economies of a modern, modernizing country adjacent to China. My current project is inspired by the book uh, called The Wandering Lake by Sven Hedin, um, who was uh, from Sweden, and he was a well-known explorer of Central and Eastern Asia, Asia during the 19th and 20th, uh, early 20th century centuries during the Great Race, um, which was the rivalry between Great Britain and Russia for supremacy in Central Asia. He was commissioned by the Chinese government in the early 20th century to find a modern Silk Road that was accessible through the desert by car. His definitive mapping of Central Asia was also used by um, explorers, subsequent explorers, to loot treasures along the Silk Road. Simultaneously, he documented his journey to find and map um, what he termed the Wandering Lake, um, and this was to describe Lake Lopnor, which was in western China. Um, this lake moved positions and was lost and mismapped before it was uh, found again in another location. You see these are different uh, maps of different times um, when people were trying to map it and, and it had moved as well. Um, so I went um, uh, to try to get to the now evaporated lake bed um, of the Wandering Lake in 2009 and this was uh, months after there was uh, deadly rioting occurring um, in the autonomous region of Xinjiang uh, between the Uyghur minorities and the Han Chinese. Um, so they had cut off the internet and, um, and uh, brought in military troops. I'm interested in how when a geographical body shifts position, it displaces and calls into questions the systems and identities built up around it. It makes me think about how unstable landscape can mirror and rupture our senses of reality, place, and self. I did a series of performances with people I'd met along the way, including um, this video, which um, uh, uh, where there's been woven uh, with headscarves uh, in the Uyghur language on the back of a cotton transport truck, and um, is leapfrogging with um, a truck with Chinese character. I'm interested in the systematic, but also the serendipitous. Using the metaphor of the wandering lake as instable geography, my project is a personal associative narrative meditation on mourning, caregiving, geopolitics, and landscape. In this work, I've returned to an interest in um, my body as performer and the embodiment of a site through performance. It also investigates uh, the use of the body as a tool for seeing, feeling, researching, negotiating looking for a way for the body to produce a sensitivity between the self, others, and the world. And as a starting point, I use water as a medium of politics and poetics.
In the town of Moynak, Uzbekistan, sits the Museum of Local Lore, housed in a municipal building, where across the hall you can also apply for a marriage certificate. The museum is open by appointment only. According to their website, the main reason for a visit to Moynak is to witness the death throes of the Aral Sea and the dramatic sight of dozens of deserted fishing boats rusting at their moorings, submerged in sand, or riding the crest of a sand dune. By contrast, the museum is a humble display of local animal pelts, painted shorelines, and canned fish stacked in pyramids. The Aral Sea was once the world's fourth largest inland sea. It has lost over 80% of its water due to large-scale Soviet irrigation projects. In the 60s, the Soviet Union successively turned the dry lands of Central Asia into a giant cotton plantation by, by creating thousands of miles of canals, dams, and reservoirs over five different Central Asian republics, shifting the paths of water destined for the Aral Sea to irrigate croplands with the knowledge that the sea would disappear forever. Moynak was once the largest port of the Aral Sea. The Russian opened, opened canning factories in town to supply the soldiers fighting on the front lines of World War II with canned fish. As the sea shrank and receded, Moynak is now in the middle of the desert, in effect a reverse oasis. Thousands of miles of pipelines and canals that irrigated the water away from the Aral Sea were living proof that the sea still retained its power and volume. It was just circling and weaving and lacing the landscape in intricate patterns, probably not visible from space, but possibly from an airplane. Human innovation had misguided the water waters into holding patterns of absent-mindedness. When I went to research the RLC in 2012, um, I was suffering from morning sickness while pregnant. Uh, I was nauseous and had a heightened sense of smell and awareness and sensitivity of, of the body, um, where the boundary between what was inside and outside seemed less defined. This state made clear that the physical body, body affects the act of uh, research documentation, seeing, and all the subsequent decisions that go into art making. That research is not only intellectual or visual, but that knowledge from and through the body. This spring, I uh, decided to return to Uzbekistan and to go to the RLC, and I was hoping to spend more time in Moynak, um, the town that is now in the desert. Uh, but, beca but because of the political situation, uh, we were not welcome, and we didn't take any photographs. Um, and I was at the tail end of breastfeeding my child um, at the time, and was taking this opportunity of being a way to wean him um, from breast milk. But I decided that I would continue pumping as we traveled to the RLC. Pumping milk was a sympathetic act paralleling the decreasing flow of resources of both the body and the land. I usually pumped while we were um, sitting down and eating at mealtime, and uh, I would just dump the milk into whatever receptacle was available, and I would take um, a, photo, a quick photo to document um, the moment. And so the series of photos act um, as a stand-in for the journey um, and also the failure of representation or the possibility to represent. And so here, um, I'll finish with some of those photos.
Thank you. Is it just the right button here? Les voy a contar un cuento chino. Le For the last three decades, each time we lost a family member in my parents' native Taiwan, a moth would appear in our home in California before we had received any phone call about the death. I became very curious about how diasporic families maintain ties across vast distances between life and death, borders and oceans, and I delve into my family's various diasporic threads running throughout the Western Hemisphere, from California to Argentina and through the Trans-Pacific space. Over the years, I discovered that many cultures share this phenomenon of receiving an insect messenger from the monarch butterflies that travel on the Day of the Dead from Mexico to Canada, and Peru's blue flies, Las Moscas Azules, which swarm over the photograph of the soon-to-be deceased, to the grasshopper's bone-chilling night sun in the mountains. Perhaps the most infamous of all is the Andean taparacu, the Quechua word for a brown moth with wing patterns resembling an owl's eyes. An elder once told me that in order to break the death spell and reverse your destiny, you must pierce the gaze of the taparaku with a needle. In 2008, I moved from New York to Lima, Peru, to retrace the geography of 19th century Chinese coolie labor, as well as imaginary of Asia and the Americas, given that Peru has its highest ratio of Asian Latin Americans. It began by mapping the escape route of two rumored coolies who had ended up in the Peruvian Amazon to sell tapioca. I then followed the various Chinese migration ways towards the Andes and the Amazon River Basin weaving together migratory landmarks while documenting oral histories from elders. En route, I resurrected memories from cemeteries, guano mines on the Chincha Islands, coastal and sugar plantations, and railroads that led into the mountains until I finally arrived to El Chino, where no Chinese live. When I first arrived in Lima, I thought that the airport taxi driver was driving me through Chinatown because every street corner had a chifa, a Chinese Peruvian restaurant. Chifa, ooh, bad slide, is a loan word from Cantonese that means to eat rice. It is said that the plantation owners always heard the coolie say sifa and when they were eating, so they assumed that the cuisine was called chifa. One time on a microbus in Lima, when I requested to get off the bus, the driver skipped my stop, sped ahead, and then arbitrarily halted in front of a chifa. Perhaps he thought I was hungry. And then in a, a new neighbor um, I met on the street asked me, Senorita, at which chifa do you work at? Well, strangely enough, chifar is a verb that is derived from chifa. And it also means, um, well, to eat chifa is what the verb means, but it also means to have sex with a woman. Wow, what's going on? Okay. Um, and I was also constantly accosted by people on the street with racialized remarks referring to Alberto Fujimori, the Japanese proven ex-president who was on trial for human rights violations um, during my stay in Lima. He was nicknamed El Chino, and as I couldn't escape being associated with El Chino, um, I started introducing myself as the first lover of Peru because I couldn't be the first lady. I was constantly mistaken as Japanese Peruvian art star Pauchi Sasaki, so I started to haunt her in a series of performances. Despite these humorous encounters, I found that my belonging in the Americas was constantly challenged, and I really despise being reduced to gendered and racialized slurs such as China, Chinita, or Oriental. Or Oriental, yes. On some occasions, I was interrogated, ¿Qué sos? What are you? Greeted with a namaste bow, a 
expected to demonstrate Tai Chi on the man, asked which Kung Fu movie I starred in, had my hair stroked while being told I was a geisha. Furthermore, given the particular relationship that Chinese have with my parents' Taiwanese homeland, the Chinita blanket label unsettled me, even if the colloquial definition of Chinita encompasses all Asian women. Chinita haunted me. So annoyed, I started a folk etymological dissection of the word Chino to better understand the history and the imaginings of Asian Latin America. So show of hands, how many people here um, speak Spanish? Ah, perfecto. So here's a quick Spanish lesson on how to speak Chino. Um, and just for a little background info, um, when you change the ending of the letter from O to A, you change the gender of the subject, but it shows the variations of how this will um, evolve throughout the presentation. So what is this? Are we awake? China. China, China. But did you also know in Quechua pronounced China, it means a young girl, and also it could also mean anyone with indigenous characteristics. Um, Monumento a la Chinita in Venezuela. Chinita Airport in Venezuela. Um, also, Chinitas, China Supai is the Andean Diablada festival, the wife of the devil, um, and in south, southern Peru. Um, the wife of a gaucho is China. Also, 50 cents in Peru is China. So you take Asian woman and 50 cents, and you get this brilliant ad by Brahma. <laughs> Little children, chinos y chinas. Alberto Fujimori, you know him, but also another ex-president, El Chino Velasco. And between lovers, mi chino y mi china. Chicken pox in Cuba. Chinita, ladybug. Fumar una china to smoke marijuana. Ojos till you get ojos chino, little Chinese eyes. And you get to squint to chinear in the verb. And you get Chinese style eyes, slanted eyes, ojos arrascados o ojos achinados. And then also haladita, which I was constantly called, hey haladita, which means to pull your eyes up. Straight hair in Cuba, curly hair in Mexico, bald, naked, a hairless naked dog, perro chino, in northern Peru. So to sum this all up, one idiom that summarizes this is cuento chino, a Chinese story, but really means a tall tale or a very convoluted lie. Returning to retracing coolie geography, I eventually arrive in that village called Chino in the Amazons. However, as there is no official version of the first Chinese man to arrive in El Chino, the only documented Asian presence in El Chino is that I, Beatrice Glow, was the first North American Chinita to arrive this century. <laughs> Trying to give form to social imaginary, I began to wonder if the romanticized other was perceivable by the senses, it would probably be the lemony floral notes of the Chinese perfume tree, whose aroma comes and goes like an apparition. Perhaps this evocative scent was where the new world was conceived, fertilized by spicy rumors of an exotic and resource-rich resource Asia that motivated Europeans to set sail and mistaken the Americas for India. The Chinese perfumes tree's aroma likens to the mandarin orange, a fruit that was introduced to England via the Chinese, but traces far back to North India. In Puerto Rico, orange juice is gaona china. I mean, and orange soda is una chinita. Now, does this association between China and oranges and perhaps have anything to do with the endless mandarin orange orchards, along with ginger fields and bamboo forests um, in Chanchamayo, Peru, that were planted by Chinese settlers in the 19th century? And what about those famous oranges from Florida, the US, that are marketed as Valencia oranges, but were developed by a Chinese immigrant, Lu Jinggong? And in Southeast Taiwan, in Chenggong, Xinggang, my uncle grows the best oranges and he calls them Falencia, Valencia. What is the historical relationship between Asia and the Americas? The presence of Asians and the Americas can be traced back to the 16th century with the Manila Alcapuco galleon trade that connected Americas with Asia. It was when the abanico, the fan of possibilities, opened up and Manton de Manila became a Spanish tradition. It was then followed by 19th century labor migrations of Chinese and Indian coolies to Latin America and the Caribbeans, the recruitment of uh, Chinese to build transcontinental railroads in North America and Pacific Islanders annexed by the US. Despite this long history, the Asianness of the Americas has not been particularly embraced. 
In fact, anti-Asian sentiment can be clearly evidenced by exclusionary immigration policies, forced removal and expulsions, and episodic violence. The result? of this historical legacy has meant that the widespread presence of Asians in the hemisphere has largely been ignored, misrepresented silence, similar to the scattered, untraceable scent of the Chinese perfume tree. So, who are the real Chinos versus the imaginary Chinos? In recent years, as more and more Asian Latin Americans have moved to North America and their respective ethnic homelands, how can we understand Asian Americas beyond the simplistic binaries of North and South America and Eastern and Western cultures? I began to visit Chinese Peruvian elders in remote areas of Peru to hear their stories. I remember Alfonso Shoki Leung Ho recounting the horror of Chinese workers getting cooked alive in boiling animal fat in Chapin's soap factory. Jorge Liao Estrella joking about his father wanted to send him to China to counterattack the Japanese as a kamikaze pilot. Marco Farfan revealing a Chinese grandmother and his Afro Peruvian lineage. And Enrique Cam Nunes proudly showing me his fake alien ID card that stated he was from China despite the fact he never set foot in China. I had journeyed far away from home only to meet strangers in distant lands who too shared nostalgia for places in which she never belonged. Be it an island or a landmass, these places live forever in our minds as homelands that never were. When Antonio Chimbon entrusted me to locate his uncle's grave on his behalf, I realized the project transcended my initial curiosity about Asian presence in the Americas beyond my struggle against the Chinita label and grew into the mission to give those stories a chance to be heard. Yo me convertí. I became Taparacu. Toward the end of my time in Peru, the aunt who inspired my journey to Argentina passed. Following this episode, bees came to visit me for seven consecutive days, each landing on my navel as though to open a portal to my invisible umbilical cord. Last October, my maternal grandmother passed, and a grasshopper visited us for 88 days and peculiarly shared her love for sponge cake and pan-fried fish. It also refused to eat leaves just like her. The content of the migratory museum I created in the diasporic spirit remains scattered between Peru and New York. The collection includes objects and papers from the journey, such as a basket that's getting passed around from the Chino village, a preserved taparacu moth, a family tree dating back to the Tang Dynasty, bamboo stalks and ginger roots, and abandoned railroad spruce dikes, and a jewelry box with a chinita carving. How should I archive other people's memories? And at what point do they become my memories? What if my memory falters? During my travels, I heard whispers of pre-Columbian contact between Asia and the Americas. There's a book penned by Francisco Loaiza in 1948 titled The Chinese Arrived Before Columbus. There are undeniable parallels between the costumes used in the Chinese diet opera and those of Ande and Diablada festival. Peruvian researcher Fernando Trasignia suggests that moche ceramics depict Asian visitors. The origin myth of Lambayeque civilization of the northern coast of Peru tells of an almond-eyed Lord Nailam who arrived from the ocean with hundreds of concubines. Of all the speculations of a prehistoric affair between Asia and the Americas, perhaps the most concrete one is that of Austronesia, a 5,000-year-old Trans-Pacific human migration story that began in Taiwan, expanded to Madagascar, east to Rapa Nui, or known as Easter Island, north to the Hawaiian Islands, and south to New Zealand, connecting the liquid continent by Austronesian linguistic roots. 
These pioneers of the Pacific inspired me to create Aquarium from Austronesia, a performance installation aboard a World War II steamship docked on the Hudson River in New York. I looked to the ship as a reservoir of our cultural imagination and created illuminated paper mache lanterns depicting fish from my grandmother's village in southeastern Taiwan that can be found throughout Austronesian's waters, connecting continents to islands to cultures. I projected Pacific marine life onto the portholes to evoke an aquarium or else a sunken ship. Austronesia's story evokes reimaginings of human interconnectivity and diasporic circulations by diluting divisive notions of borders and suggesting that we may all have a decent cousin in Madagascar or perhaps a coolie relative. Remember that grasshopper? It's still standing straight up in my grandmother's bedroom in the semi-tropical village of Taiwan. Its body has not deteriorated, nor have vermin devoured the corpse. Earlier this month, near the one-year anniversary of my grandmother's passing, this messenger appeared on a New York City sidewalk. I used to think I was Indonesian until someone said, I don't look Indonesian. Apparently, I look Chinese, and the Chinese would scold me for not being able to speak Chinese. But strangely, when I say I'm Australian, no one says that I don't look Australian. And in the US, someone swore I was Indian. In Japan, they tried to speak Japanese to me. In Mexico, they called me, hola chica. And a few years ago, a Vietnamese Australian mother thought I was 12. The video that you just saw, made in 2003, was the first time I featured the passports in my work. But I've been quite keen about the passports since quite a long time ago. And I think this is because I grew up in some kind of a borderland. I talk about growing up in this borderland over and over again in different forms from different angles. To describe it simply, I grew up in the borderland of Suharto's power. Suharto was an Indonesian dictator who got into power in 1965, along with a mass killing of hundreds of thousands of people who were alleged communists. Suharto fell 33 years later in 1998, when I was 26, also with a mass killing, in a series of riots that killed a lot of Chinese Indonesians. Now, what do I mean by growing up in the borderland of Suharto's power? Let me explain. These two killings, the two bookends of Suharto's dictatorship, 1965-1998, affected me personally and deeply. But it wasn't until 1998 that I started to learn why. 
during the riots in many cities in Indonesia, in Indonesia that targeted the Chinese Indonesians, especially when the riots culminated in Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia, I witnessed the trauma that my grandmother had repressed. She was a survivor of 1965, along with her first son, my dad, who was a young man then, um, and his nine siblings, the youngest of whom was 10. Their family house was burnt down and the family had to be scattered across different islands in Indonesia to seek refuge. 1998 seemed to have reminded my grandma a lot of 1965. And it was only when I was 31, a few years later, that I could gather my courage to speak publicly about a secret that I've had to keep until then. My grandfather was also killed in 1965. I had to keep this as a secret because during Suharto, it would have been impossible to lead a life if you related with people who were killed in 1965 because then you'd be related to an evil communist. On top of that, in Indonesia, because, my, or because of my looks, I'm regarded as a Chinese Indonesian. So there you go. Double jackpot. This is what it's like living in a borderland. Not a physical or geographical borderland, no, and mind you, a physical border wouldn't exist without the social and conceptual mechanism. If you look at the nation state as an imagined community, that's a term coined by Ben Anderson, and he's a political scientist who was banned from entering Indonesia during Suharto as well. Um, if you see the nation building as the act of imagining a community, there must always be the border that defines who's in and who's out. This borderline needs to be a space, not a line, but a space, to allow flexibility so that who's in and who's out and when can be played well. Because if I'm entirely out, then I'm out of the control. I'm useless to the system. So no, I wasn't entirely out. I was placed based on my background, both my looks and my secret in this borderland, outside sort of, but controlled, and thus dispensable. If, if so, if you're wondering why I'm so obsessed with the border, well, it came from simply trying to figure out why I was treated the way I was treated legally and socially. But along the way of figuring things out, I also learned that in a bordered system like this, the individual does make a, diff a big difference in a couple of ways. Firstly, I have countless experiences where I learned that it's easy to be marginalized when you're dehumanized. When I'm stripped of my individuality, I become just a number, just a Chinese, just an Arab, just a Muslim, just a Christian, just a black, just a Latino, just a white, just an outsider. But it's harder to be marginalized when you're seen as individuals because then you're being dealt with in another level of understanding, right? And then through other experiences, I also learned that even when the border is reinforced by the government law, at the end of the day, the, the law is actually implemented by an individual. This has happened in all parts of the world, and I've experienced this a lot, beneficial to me or not. For example, in 2011, I was deported from Frankfurt Airport by a border police officially accusing me of attempting illegal entry with invalid visa, despite of the fact that the issuer of the visa stated and restated that my visa was still in the valid. At the same time, though, another border police in Frankfurt Airport, seeing that the deportation was a technical glitch between the officials, which I have no control of, helped me to get in again. And two weeks later, with a few other officers also having to bypass a few regulations in the process, I got into Germany from Moscow through Stuttgart. So I learned that the individual is significant in the making and the breaking of the border. And this is formed the basis of my game performances. My game performances are participatory environments where I emulate border mechanisms and systems. It's also an act of placemaking where I engage individuals to do things and talk about the border and all relevant matters like migration and displacement, governance and individual agency, trade and global imbalance. I set the rules for my game performances, of course, but that's the beauty of it, right? Because I'm an individual 
And I can be as cheeky as I want with my rules, but the other individuals, the participants, can be even more cheeky than I am. A unique participant doing something that another unique participant responds to eventually results in unpredictability. The more individuals participate, the more unexpected the twists and turns in the playing out of the process. This also helps me to challenge the idea that, that the border is fixed and unchanging. Terra incognita, et cetera, for example, has been done six times in the last three, uh, five years, reaching thousands of people. When I did it in Art State Singapore in 2012, for example, I engaged 700 participants one-on-one -on -one in three days. This one was in Chaja Bainil, which was pure fun. Each time the resulting new world map before it was painted back to white was always different. I realized that what I was doing was opening up the production process in my work as a space to get individuals involved. So I thought to open the production process further. For example, Terra Incognita, etc. comes with a DIY kit, so anyone can do it at the comfort of their own space, anyone. Like when a fellow artist, Orawan Arunrak, who's based in Bangkok, did it in my absence. The picture up there shows, shows it in the BACC in Bangkok in end of 2013 amidst the riots posted by someone on Facebook who's not related to me. It looks quite wild. Well, I knew that the more participants are involved, the more complexity I can introduce to my processes, and the further away from black and white it becomes. Individu individuals are like colors in my painting. The more colors I have, work, uh, I have to work with, the more depth I can put into my painting. This is great because the more individuals I, I engage, the more conversations I can initiate, the bigger snowball I can eventually create. So my next question was, how can I involve even more individuals in my process? So I turned to the economic triad. I've looked at production. Now let's go to distribution and consumption, right? Now, lore 2009 has been attracting big masses of people wherever it was shown. In the Moscow Biennial in 2011, for example, the machine was broken to, due to overuse the first weekend after the opening. And I was told that while the machine was being repaired, a visitor wanted his entry fee back because he went back to the show only to play lore to, to win some passwords. In Art Hong Kong in 2012, the machine had as many as 300 players per day. And by the way, they pay $1 each and they don't always win a passport. So the consumption is certainly not the problem with this work. <laughs> and my initial calculations say that the machine is actually profitable and thus self-sustainable. Now, with its newest iteration, I try to open the distribution and production processes further. The citizen shop randomizer, that's what it's called, will soon be installed in a cafe in Jakarta and we're gonna donate the profit to a migrant organization. With this, this Jakarta partnership as the model, I'm now looking for nine other partners around the world to install this work permanently. So if any of you are interested in getting involved, please, please see me after the, the talk and we'll talk. Now, with such a focus on connecting people, in 2013 I thought, hey, maybe I should get rid of my, the objects in my work so I can focus on relating and connecting, right? So with Babel, I steered away from objects by making it a sound installation, featuring poets and voices of people from Sharjah, Jogja, and Jakarta. However, while the 16 synchronized speakers were hidden to avoid a focus on physical objects, being distributed around the site, they evidently transformed the whole space into a physical object containing the people who explored the work. So, with Odong Dangding prototype in 2014, just earlier this year, I took a thoroughly object-based participatory approach. I fully exploit an existing physical object to create engagement with people. In this project, I began by modifying a pedal car, having identified it as a cultural object created out of necessity by a grassroots microeconomics network, network in a public square in Jogja, Indonesia. Because of its nature as a cultural object, the process of modification gave me the reason to work closely with a local network, 
forming a new network with potentials that I'm currently following up in further projects based in Melbourne, Australia, potentially involving the Jogja community. I'm currently preparing a solo show in Hong Kong, opening end of 2015 with a similar method of an object-based, people-focused, participatory method that traces the veins of local microeconomic networks that are connected through the use of a unifying cultural object, which I will modify. In the meanwhile, though, I have to report that I've sort of found an answer to the problematic question of where I'm originally from, with which I shall conclude this talk. So I hope you'll enjoy this magical video piece. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, just to quickly announce, um, to check your schedules, we are running 15 minutes behind, but we'll make it up in lunch. Instead of one hour and 15 minutes, you'll have one hour lunch break. So please stay. This is the last presentation, then we'll have a discussion, then we'll go to lunch. Thank you. Hello. My name is Manal. Um, today I'm presenting to you uh, a project I've been working on for a couple of years called Crash. Most of my work over the many years I've been doing this focuses on the idea of active forgetting and intentional erasing from collective memories. I specifically focus on found images, images that are placed in spaces that are meant for mass communication. These worry me because of the idea of these images being repeated over and over. Crash focuses on a very unique phenomena that happens in my country, Saudi Arabia, where women um, are allowed to be employed, only 3% of women are employed, and the majority of these women um, tend to go into the teaching profession because it's segregated to women. All of these, many, many of them, are appointed to remote villages uh, across the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia because there's a positive side to it where every girl has the right to an education regardless of the size of her village, but the women that teach are asked to travel hundreds of miles, many hours, uh, to reach these villages. Most of the time, because women do not drive in Saudi Arabia, they're not allowed to drive, they hire, with their very small salaries, a driver, it's not legal, uh, an unsafe car, and they share eight women at a time in a car. They travel about three in the morning or four in the morning to reach their schools at 7 a.m. For the past 25 years, teachers have been dying on a daily basis due to car crashes because of um, bad driving, or driver fatigue. What caught my attention in this phenomena that's been reported forever, there are websites dedicated to it, news presenters talk about it uh, daily, but is the, the way it is reported. So if you see the article on the right, every single time there's a crash uh, report, there's an image of a car crash with no humans in it. Then the text on the side describes the location of the crash, the nationality of the driver, and all the police officers' names, and the officials that came to oversee this project. 
there is never a mention of the teachers' names because there is this tradition in Saudi Arabia and actually in the region where uh, tribes are embarrassed to mention or to pronounce the names of their, women's in, in, their women in public. So I started to gather hundreds of these, uh, of these articles and start to document how many times do women um, get their names mentioned. I also started to obsessively plot where their schools were. And the majority of these schools and where the crashes happen cannot be found on any maps, not on Google. I had to go on to websites of tribes and ask them, where is your tribe located uh, on the map? And they would pin, drop a pin for me or give me uh, GPS coordinates. I created triangulations and started to address specific statistics that are, we knew about these crashes. And then later developed artworks. This is more research. It's also, again, uh, edited articles where they first report the report correctly with some names. And then the second iteration, you see there's underlines of deleted text, is when they removed all the names of the women and allowed it to be completely neutral of their names. And then it turns out, I decided to take in all this information and this research and develop this kind of artwork where when you're standing quite close to it, it's a beautiful um, abstract gray, uh, shades of gray artwork, but the second you step away, you realize it's a gruesome car crash. And the idea is when these articles were repeated over and over in my society for the past 25 years, people have become numb to this information. And because it's been repeated over and over, it has dehumanized the women that are the victims of these crashes. And it's become easier to abuse them and easier to accept their death without ever addressing um, the issue of these women dying. Statistics for just 2013, 130 crashes. 76 teachers injured, 15 teachers dead, only two names ever mentioned. So how do you protest a loss or something deemed inexistent? How do you mourn if the suffering has no face? How do you memorialize if the memory is suppressed? This project was developed because of a very important issue that I want to bring up today at, uh, in this platform, is experimental spaces. I was supported by Mat'haf, which is a museum in Doha, who had recently opened that year uh, a space called Project Space, led by Dr. Abdullah Krum. He had offered it to me to do whatever I want, experimental with no artwork in mind, no exhibition, no pressure. These kind of spaces are rarely available to artists in the Middle East. Um, it allowed me to do my research, to engage with uh, students, to engage with academics, to speak to writers, to document everything I wanted to document with no pressure of producing anything. The introduction of the experimental spaces in Mat'haf, and now there's a grant that I'm on, a fellowship uh, via NYU, University of uh, New York, called FIND. Um, these institutions that give me these spaces are creating future context for the production and reception of art as a practice. So imagine a region that has no museums, just recently a few galleries, um, and then audiences are expected to engage with contemporary art. It is a very hard equation. We're starting sort of upside down in this situation, and these spaces allow people to come in and engage with an artist studio, almost, a thought process that goes into what comes out in the end. These institutions have the idea that they will become, or are becoming now, incubators for creation of art rather than simply dissemination. Given that idea, not everyone has access. Actually, it is the only, I think, uh, experimental space, um, a few of them exist in the region. So artists are pushed into creating 
their own experimental spaces. And for me, for the past years, I've been working in participatory art because of the space it gives me to develop projects. Um, I'm gonna skip this one for time. So this is one of my participatory projects called Tree of Guardians. Artists sometimes will have to do different things to create a sustainable system to support investigative artistic pra practice that educates and engages their future audiences. Participatory art is the independent experimental space that is reimagined and self-organized organized beyond the structures of institutions and their frameworks. So Tree of Guardians was a project. Not, it was designed to ask women to develop family trees of women only. In Saudi Arabia and probably the countries around us, when there are family trees, it's only men. Women are never included in the family tree. Therefore, they are actively being erased from memory. So what I did is I traveled across the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, 400 women participated. None, the majority, have never been to a museum or ever uh, interacted with a contemporary art project. But they all came in masses because the idea attracted them to memorialize the women in their lives. I asked them to draw family trees that included only their women, the women in their life. The idea was not to create a project about lineage. It was an exercise of, uh, it was an exercise to actually just explore when do memory disappear, when do women disappear from memory? At what generation do we stop remembering the names? And it was at the beginning, women came in, um, I gave lectures about, first of all, contemporary art, so it's a, a part lecture, part uh, art uh, practice. And then I asked them to start drawing their family trees. And then they walked into these uh, uh, rooms laughing and giggling. But in the end, it became very stressful for them because if you can only remember two generations of women in your life, you start feeling guilty. And then there's that um, sense of responsibility that I'm the one now putting down. And because this, uh, all of these drawings go into a larger electronic archive and the artwork, the names of the women, become permanent installation. So there was a large amount of stress within the room about, um, I can't remember, I can't remember. They started to call families. They created sort of a ripple effect within their own circles of remembrance and discussion and reflection on the memory of women in their lives. The final product was this installation. So in my constant questioning of the idea of disappearance and act of forgetting, it has led me to its counterbalance, the necessary act of preservation. In its fullest sense, however, the act of preservation must transcend the identity of the single identifiable, indivi identifiable individual and encompass previous and future generations of women. In other words, today women have the power to reclaim the collective legacy of generations of women who might otherwise be lost to memory. In conclusion of my talk today, I've uh, asked the uh, guys upstairs to run a video. This video was produced during my residency at Madhaf. And I had students come in and hang out in my uh, workspace. Uh, some of them Saudi, some of them Qatari. Uh, and they were all studying theater at that point. And they just decided to come and make a corner theirs in my space. Um, I asked them, what are they studying? They said theater. I said, how would you like to interact with this project? And we came up with the idea of humanizing the legacy and the memory of the women in Crash. So we addressed it through this video where um, we decided to create the emotion. So when you watch a movie and it's based on a real story, your emotions are real, um, but knowing that the video is unreal. So one of the girls, a bunch of uh, different women did different videos, but this is one of them, chose a character in one of the stories and decided to give it a human face so that the people who interact with the project have real emotions. If you can run the video, please. And thank you. I was in the house, I 
أنا وزميلاتي الخمسة رحنا للمسجد الحي وصلنا الفجر مع بعض زي دائما ومن بعدها رجعنا للباص كان بقيلنا 200 كيلومتر عبر نوصل المدرسة فعشان يعني يمر الوقت بسرعة نحب نتكلم على أشياء بسيطة أشياء بسيطة عن حياتنا مثلا زميلتي رجية كعطول كيف تبغى تحضر غدا جديد لطفلها الصغير لأنه طفش من الأكل دائما وصحبتي فوزية قاعدة تقول كيف فرحانة من بنتها جابت علامات كويسة في الثانوية تبغى تفاجئها بهدية حلوة ومن بعدها جات سيارة في عكس الطريق وصدمت بالباص وتقلبنا وتوفت Thank you. Okay, so I'll just um, I, I'll just uh, formulate some you know some thoughts were happening when we were talking, and so it's not not so um, formulated exactly, but I noticed in you know some of the strategies of the presentations that were given um, this morning, um, a couple of things that you know kept running through my mind, like the the use of um, something that acted maybe like a, something like an index, where it was uh, a thing that um, was, um, you know, coming up again and again, um, like for you, the, the island, you know, that, that has like, m could have multiple variations, um, and also in that way act as something unstable. Um, and, you know, for you, language, where it's kind of the same word, but then there's multiple meanings, so, and for you, the passport and the border. Um, and by the way, I just want to know, are there real passports you can get in the, in the machine? Okay, I would pay a dollar for that. But, so anyway, so I just thought about the, that sort of connection um, between those, you know, um, uh, between that strategy, and I was just wondering, you know, if anyone wants to talk more about that, <coughs> or not, <laughs> <laughs> or just a thought, you know. Thanks, Patty. What pressure. <laughs> well, I, I don't know if I'm responding directly to that, but I felt there were, this was such an amazing group hearing everyone. I feel like there's so many overlaps from collective memory and how to remember and diasporic notions and these social imaginaries about have, occupying different um, spaces and territories and switching lands with people. That was so beautiful. And islands, I, I love that we all talked about the water connections and the liquid continent and what that really is. And that was made my heart leap so many times hearing all these um, themes that kept on uh, popping up. Um, and I, in terms of like linguistics or islands, I think they all um, kind of talk about the underwater connection um, that we're all islands connected with 
by whether it's biotic um, migration, such as fish that I was thinking a lot about, or the Austronesians that kind of travel on the on the ocean front, but also um, I think what's so amazing about like thinking about Tintin is just that there's no border really, right? And the border is all social construct. And when you take it apart, it opens up a whole nother beautiful space. Ooh, my turn, okay. <laughs> wow, okay. Um, um, I, I would like to, um, uh, I guess, extend on uh, your both your um, um, summaries, I guess. Um, um, well, we were given 15 minutes, so I guess I'm, I'm sure, you know, like your practice are just much more, you know, um, colorful and, and, you know, and, and we just have to choose one line to present here. And I, because that's, that's, that's in my case, it was like that. So, so basically, sorry? A pop song. A pop song. <laughs> one line. Yes, that's true. It is like a trailer, isn't it? And, um, and so, yeah, so um, I guess uh, um, for me, it was just, I guess, one, one way to describe it. And, and yeah, I mean, it's, it's really, I think, still open to interpretations. And of course, you know, like a lot of other words were, had to be, you know, like um, deprioritized. And yeah, what about you? Well, you know, I was deported from Frankfurt Airport too. Oh, yeah. oh, yes. <laughs> So I really bonded with you on that experience, but I never went back. I was quite upset, uh, but you did get back through. I was going to see Castle at that point, and I had a valid visa. Yeah, yeah. So I do. It's very interesting how uh, the majority of themes that we discussed today are, or yesterday too, really um, interweave into everybody else's practices, and like the the moments that you're talking about were also felt by me. Um, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to speak about on this platform, but definitely um, this is a stage or this is a space where I think an opportunity for all of us to connect. And I've already just getting off the stage, somebody has spoken to me about another experimental space that exists here in the United States. And this is an amazing chance for artists, curators, and um, writers to interact, academics, whoever, wherever you work is, to make use of this time and try to engage with us because we're here actually to um, uh, promote a sort of a decision in life to um, uh, give out a message through our work and uh, a support system like this is integral for every, every artist. Thank you. I have a question for you. Yes. I'm just curious about how you take on the burden of, of archiving um, memory and creating that history how do you actually, I mean, it, I think it creates a physical difference in you when you hear these stories, you palpitate, you maybe tear up a little inside when you hear these things. How do you um, take on all these stories and channel into something else instead of holding something heavy in your heart? Sorry, that's a little intense, but I'm curious. Thank you, Thank you for asking me a question. Um, I do sometimes feel a huge responsibility. This project for Crash is uh, a very <laughs> dear to my heart, a very sad, um, but also creating an archive is something that I started with my fellowship now with NYU, and um, I'm creating a mo uh, an archive of the modern Saudi woman uh, under the title uh, Negotiating Spaces. And now, of course, when you say something like that, it sounds so, you know, I'm creating an archive. But in reality, me and my partner, my research partner, Dr. Ramey Dabbar, um, we've decided to turn it over on itself because what is an archive? We are questioning the idea of archive. Who has been archiving throughout these years? And who has selected what is allowed to stay in memory and what is deleted from memory? And then on top of this, we go back and address the issue of the Saudi woman. Woman, like, like the Asian woman, the Taiwan woman, the um, Middle Eastern woman. It's just so limiting. And, and the idea of saying, um, a, a museum, and this is something that's happening. I said there's no museums in Saudi, but now they're being built. There's two museums for women in Saudi Arabia being built. One built by women only, and one built by men only. 
and they both do not are clueless. <laughs> they do not include anything um, necessarily interesting about uh, women. So um, I can talk about this forever, so I'm not going to hog the microphone. In general, um, there's a lot of questions. This is something that experimental spaces allow you to, first of all, start with an idea, and then go back and negate it, and then go back and refine it. And, and this is such an important area to be in when you're thinking about the concepts before producing art. Um, I guess since you were talking about archive, I, was, I actually immediately thought about map office, and would you yeah. tell us more? <laughs> yeah, it looks like uh, this morning was very well curated. But, <laughs> 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 but there is a line uh, that was really flowing from one presentation to another, also remembering jewelry when we did the performing the archipelago discussing about sexual assault in Frankfurt airport. So I think maybe there is something there that we should all go and investigate. That could be a next collective project. But uh, definitely, yeah, mapping techniques, investigation, some kind of criminolo criminology uh, mapping strategies were all involved. And, and what is fantastic, I think, in all our projects is never giving conclusion, but always like opening further possibilities, and especially I really enjoyed um, your presentation, uh, absorbing uh, the South American and entire continent with this uh, uh, thread, um, Chino, China, and Chiquita, and <laughs> Chinita, <laughs> and, and just crazy rhythm of speech that, uh, that you, you gave, or, or Patty's, I mean, amazing translation, because we work a bit with uh, Amal Ghul and the RLC and the drawing and all the secretures that she start to, 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 to foster from this kind of condition and you giving milk back to the land, I think is so beautiful and, uh, and personality connected into this kind of uh, perceptions and imaginations of the territories and, and very free engagement we also um, conduct with those territories. So yeah, very free ways of um, perceiving this world. Um, the only man of a... <laughs> yeah. um, hard task. Um, no, I, 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 I want to just uh, kind of bounce back on this idea of, of, of kind of freedom. I, I know it's a very, very strange word still. But I, I, I rely to, to your, your last video when you basically show the, magi the magician. And, and I, I really enjoy that because basically you give us possibility. And I guess that's, that's one of the, 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 the nature and somehow the, the task of an artist to basically be a, somehow a magician and, and, and not necessarily to reveal the secret, but offering possibilities of looking at the world in different ways. By even by tricks, but that's what we're doing somehow. We we tricking the other and forcing the other to look at our own perspective. I mean, obviously, yeah, we can see the world from a landmass and still fight for it, but we can also see the the world from a liquid perspective, and 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 things will be more fluid. I don't know. Maybe that's a bit of a dream, but. Um. Hi. Um, first of all, I would agree with the panel's sentiment that this was an excellently curated morning. <laughs> um, I have a question that I think hopefully applies to all of the panelists there. Um, how do you navigate the political meaning in your work? Because um, I think maybe I'm wrong, but uh, one of the things that seem to be a recurrent theme is you're in a way defying the order of the world. Um, your, your geography is not what is conceived as the conventional geography, and that will inevitably cause, um, it's kind of defying what the, the political order of the world is. And I think all of your work have um, a very strong political aspect to it. Uh, would you agree with that? And is that something that you try to deliberately confront, or is it something that you think you leave to the viewers to decide for themselves? That's a, a 
really nice uh, question and sentiment. Um, I, um, I think, I mean, for me, um, yeah, the work is political, yes, in my motivations, um, because that always brings up questions, and, you know, that's, um, which leads me to search for something, um, uh, uh, because of, uh, you know, um, trying to find meaning in things, and, um, but I guess, you know, the way I go about um, then bringing in my personal, you know, as far as, um, uh, my involvement in um, in uh, the making of a work, um, then it becomes more complicated, and then there's other layers um, of the emotional, um, of uh, you know other uh, other ways that I interact um, with the political. It's not maybe just a statement, um, but has other you know other resonances and um, other ways of being in the world um, through objects, through the self, through relationships, through family, um, through, uh, love, you know, all of these things. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe I will, I can go on. Um, I think in our case, there is one word that, uh, we use a lot and I think it's also the same for, for Tintin, which will be, um, appropriation, um, and not occupation. And, uh, and I think there is a very strong um, temporal element into our way to take something, but not for long, just for a moment, and not occupy like an army or a government would do. And uh, I think by the individual engagement, um, by appropriating and sharing then, and opening up, um, is somehow leading most of our uh, work. And I think artists also somehow appropriating museum for a time being, or, or biennales, which are even more uh, fluid in terms of, uh, of way of operating. And, uh, and by exhibiting, yeah, we appropriated time, uh, sharing some elements of work for the public, uh, but, uh, but not forever. And I think this is very much what art is about, this kind of... Uh, um, there were limited time also uh, issues. I, th I like the word um, navigate a lot, and I think a lot about um, perhaps being a physically more petite-sized woman, I have to snake through and navigate like the river a lot between different loopholes and systems. Um, so, in, in that way, you find empowerment by sort of finding other ways of being. Um, and the way of working around social imaginary is definitely a political gesture to sort of challenge what people already believe is a status quo. Um, yeah, I think I'll leave it at that. <laughs> Um, I think for me, I guess the background of why I started making art is really more directly related to politics, basically, and um, the realization that, you know, like the secret that I grew up with and never been able to talk about or ask questions about until, until I was a full adult, basically, um, that stays with me somehow, and I... I feel that <laughs> I don't really have a choice. I mean, it's, it's, this is why I'm doing art. And um, I guess about, about changing people, I don't believe in changing, like, okay, I believe in influencing maybe, or talking or discussing, and, um, but I believe people can't, I mean, if they don't want to change, they won't change. And I don't really believe in the borderless world. I mean, it's, you know, the, we're physical. I mean, you know, and, and that's why I constantly think about it, because it's real. It's, you know, uh, saying that the world is borderless is, well, it's, it's, it's not real, basically. And, and yeah, so that's, 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 that's what keeps me going, basically. Coming from a very politicized region, I don't know if I'm allowed as an artist to say my art is not political, but um, I think it's not. And uh, in reality, uh, I try to think of uh, some of my projects, especially participatory projects, as creating new platforms for engaging and thinking about 
social issues, which can be addressed politically. But at that point, there's a certain level where you start, first of all, let's talk about it uh, before we start talking about the change. And uh, specifically, when I do my big participatory projects, I travel across the country, sometimes the region, and hundreds of women who normally do not have access to internet, not because there is no internet, it's just accessible to a certain age because they got to learn about it, but women that are older than me or the age of my mother really are not engaged on, in social media. And social media has created an amazing platform in the Arab world. Um, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, there are places where people can express themselves, their political views, uh, you know, just breathe it out for a minute. And when I do these participatory projects, I usually choose a very simple social issue, like um, I had done a project about the taboo of not pronouncing women's names. So if you approach men in Saudi Arabia, even in the Gulf, and you say, what's the name of your mother? They hesitate because they find it offensive that somebody else would know the name. And so I went around the country saying, do you guys, mothers and daughters and sisters, and what, think it's offensive? No, who do you think is going to change this? Us. That's it, it was just such a simple conversation. But then they had the act of writing their names on these large scale prayer beads. So they did something about it. It wasn't just they're sitting there like, uh, like what can we do? And um, I found that once I'm done with these workshops, these women do not want to leave the room. Close lights, let's clap, thank you for participating. And they just love the energy with that space and then um, having a moment to you know, say something, do something about it. And I find that that is the most important part about uh, not political art, but let's say social art, creating platforms. Um, so I'm very interested in knowing, and I think you must, you must, you, some of you alluded to it, uh, how is your art viewed in your own nation state or your own countries? Um, and, you know, what, were there any repercussions or how did it also enhance or uh, tame your work down, if at all? In, in our case, the idea of um, of the home countries, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's a bit um, ambiguous because obviously home is Hong Kong, but uh, we come from all the other part of the world. And if I start to list them, it will be all, will take uh, the rest of the time. So uh, basically, the way we, we we try to, as artists, we try to to work on on specific context and 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 vision. Um, what what the specific context offer and all these specific contexts could uh, could go even beyond by addressing global issue and so on. So we we have the chance to operate in a context that we have no restriction and we can basically approach whatever topic and uh, in whatever format uh, we want. Uh, that uh, include. Uh, uh, sexuality, violence, or whatsoever we would like to approach. So we have no restriction at all. No, the only only restriction is our own uh, self uh, censorship. That's basically the way we operate in that. Okay. So.